Hi, everybody. Welcome again to another episode of On Air with Owen. Really excited about today's conversation. I am joined by Greg Freeman, who is the VP of Revenue at Clean.ai. Um, and we are going to be talking about all things related to the first person and the first hire in the sales function. Uh, really good start to have your phone cracking on, Greg. Love, absolutely love that. Uh, but hey, we're all about informality. So let's start as we mean, mean to go on on this one. Thanks for joining us today. Yeah, appreciate it. Yeah, appreciate you having me, Owen. And obviously, I've seen a couple of your episodes already, and they've been really good and strong topics. So looking forward to diving into a, a topic I'm pretty passionate about. Well, no pressure. I think people are going to really enjoy this one. I'm genuinely really looking forward to it. And and obviously, we're talking about a topic that is really close to your heart, but but something you're talking about and posting about a lot as well right now. Mm. But before we get into it, can you just give us the one or two minutes? Who's Greg and 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 who's clean.ai? Oh, mate, I'm pretty boring, so I'll try and keep it as quick as I can. So uh, right, 20 name, seconds, as, as you already said, my name is Greg Freeman. I'm the Vice President of Revenue at um, clean.ai. Clean helps scaling businesses, startup scale ups, go on their data journey. So get their data sorted basically um, in, a, in a quick and easy way. Um, and I've uh, joined the business about 11 and a half months ago, 12 months ago um, as the first sales hire, which is the, the topic we're talking about. Um, by the end of the week, by the end of the week, we'll be at, um, we'll, we'll be at nine in the, in the commercial team and by a month from now we'll be at 12 so um it's growing out quite nicely and it's it's been a fun journey to this point amazing thank you thank you very much so let's let's talk about first sales hire but let's talk about why and when first so when what if you're a founder what's the stage that you're starting to look at this what are the types of businesses that are going through this journey right now yeah i mean that is actually a really wide berth question and, and the reason mm. for that is that I think there's there's two key triggers for founders um, and they have upside and downside um, for the salesperson or the potential hire. And um, the the first is the like we've hit our straps. We, we like as founders, we've kind of we've done founder sales. We've got it. We just need to like formalize this, bring somebody in who's kind of mature enough, senior enough to do a job that is just closing deals more readily because founders do their best but actually like the application of technique and stuff like that doesn't doesn't go amiss in the, in the sales process even when it's hitting its straps so that's kind of the first time that people start to go oh yeah okay we've we've done a good job as founders let's let's hit the ground running and get somebody in and um i think that's definitely uh if, you, if you're in that spot you want to you want to be going for somebody who is pretty proven actually because if you've already got a bit of product market fit you've already got a bit of go-to-market fit things are going to escalate quite quickly and if you pull somebody into junior they then can't scale the business with with you from there so yeah. that's the first point the other is um i think kind of where um clean was when i joined which is they've got a handful of of customers and there were some good logos in there like our our, our biggest client is is moon pig so they're um obviously a really good client mm -hmm. for us um, but they'd done it in a very kind of consultative sell type of way. It was, um, our founders have got really strong backgrounds in the London data scene. Like Matt was formerly chief data officer at Trainline. Um, Drew was in charge of the data team and not on the high street. So they come with a lot of credibility, which meant they could lead with consultancy and then put a piece of software in. What um, we are looking for, but but then they then where do you take that i guess mm. it's the big question um and, and as is the case with a lot of founders they they weren't able to process drive that and make yeah. it into a repeatable a repeatable structure because it's not a scalable model actually to do consultative implementation yeah. every time you're a consultancy if you do that mm. so they went out looking for somebody to to um to do that with they were going to go with the junior hires, actually, which was quite interesting. Um, they'd had some um, fairly bang average advice from uh, a person in the industry that they should just hire some junior people, like a couple yeah. of SDRs or sort it. Not not the way forward in reality. Um, and Jerry, who I know you know, Jerry Hill, um, mm. is a personal friend of Matt's. And he said, is this guy, Greg, who you might want to speak to? It's kind of what he does. He goes into businesses early takes them through their first 50, 100, 150 logos, and I think that'll get you off the ground. 
introduction was done and it was like a matter of a matter of like two two weeks or so really top from first introduction to to agreeing to join and that's the other time that people do it when when they need that that genuine help to get going so do you know what it's interesting because there aren't many gregs around right i think there's a lot of people and you've touched on it there that we were going to hire some junior um some junior people some in role individual contributors sdrs and then equally there'd be people coming from done it 10 times over sitting in a senior seat somewhere who would cost a lot of money and one of the things i like about your content is you explore the different options and i think a lot of the time founders don't realize there's options they go for a head of sales and they get what they get and that's it i think like anything there's an element of planning and strategy behind it so let's look at look at some of those options so founders got a business to a point where they can't keep selling because they could be doing other things. They want to grow it out. They want to scale it. They need a repeatable model and they need somebody or somebody's to come in to do that for them and go forward. Realistically, though, I'm guessing the founder has to be involved to a degree um, okay. and it's still going to eat some of their time, but doesn't want to be in it. So a junior hire means that you're in it more. And I'm guessing that's one of the main restrictions around it, that you're suddenly running a sales department when you've never run a sales department and that sort of thing at the lower level. Yeah, I think like, especially if, especially if there's no processing already, mm. um, if, there's, if there's no real kind of like sales founder involved, you don't actually get much better by hiring a junior person because you're not building a sales engine, you're just, carrying like somebody else is doing the same yeah that you've just been doing and probably well. pretty crappy way yeah. a pretty crappy cadence and and that doesn't really improve you and that's yeah. the same even if you've hit your straps even if founder sales are going well the whole point of getting going is to be better than you were yesterday as a business and if it's just a different new person who probably doesn't even have that founder pull founder credibility it's just a 25 30 year old like well, that's probably not an age thing, given that I'm I'm barely th- I'm barely over thirty. <laughs> probably, should, probably shouldn't be down to age. I know what you mean, um, but yeah, crack on. <laughs> but somebody who's uh, somebody who's like not kind of done it before. Yeah. You are you are looking at like what can they actually implement? And I think the only the only potential sweet spot you might get to is is somebody who um, was very early stage at a, a, a business um, mm-hmm. as the third or fourth hire. They may have seen enough to to iterate, to change, yeah. to build, but in a lot of cases, if that business has gone on to be successful, they are now head of sales there or they're yeah. director of sales there. So they're not just going to jump to you. So yeah, you need, you need to find, you, it's a, it's difficult to find someone who gets the strategic modeling of a sales mm-hmm. engine, but is also willing to do what you have to do, which when you join the company as the first sales hire, you basically go back to being an SDR at first. Yeah. Like you, you have to go back to making 60 to 100 calls a day, getting all the contacts in the database, all that kind of stuff. Mm. And it's a, it's a, it's a small set of people who are, uh, who are, who are willing to do that. So that's, um, that's kind of, I think what most people should be looking for from their, uh, yeah, it's interesting. I'm guessing that even if, let's say, you did take that approach of I'm going to hire an SDR in, yeah, well, a, a decent SDR, let's say, somebody who's been around the block a bit, but still just at that top end of the SDR level. Even if you've got a really good one, I'm guessing all you're doing is 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 that band aid solution, isn't it? Because they might go really well, but sooner or later they're going to leave unless there's a different role. They can't necessarily do the next stage, which is the strategic planning growth stage. <laughs> Um, leading people, hiring a team. Maybe they can and you get lucky again, but necessarily. Um, and what they're doing isn't repeatable. So you then suffer from fools gladly hiring a second one thinking, great, it works really well. And there are once in a, one in a million in terms of their results. And I guess it causes all sorts of problems in terms of speed to market in that kind of yeah. medium to long term phase. Is that, is that fair? Yeah, I, I think it, it massively is. Like, mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it, that, that band-aid on a bullet wound is not a bad analogy, actually, because what you're doing is, yeah, you speed it up, but all you're really doing is speeding it up to being broken again, because like yeah. you've not got the person that can solve it. Um, and I think unless, unless founders really get sales, which not many of them do, because otherwise they wouldn't be hiring someone to do it in most cases, like su- success, there are successful startups out there who they're, sales mm. founder carries them possibly even further than they should but it does it they do it successfully yeah. um like i've got a few even in my mind that that, that works at it it mm. gets their series a their series b because that person actually gets sales infrastructure yeah. from the sales engine themselves even if they should probably spend less time doing it 
if you've got product led founders or technical founders, like they don't even know how to hire salespeople. So how do you, mm. how do you find the, like there's one thing salespeople are really good at and it's selling themselves. And so many salespeople are full of absolute shit. So for a for a for a founder who's non yeah. like non sales knowledgeable, non commercial, like would much rather be sat working on a product. How do they even hire the right SDR? Like mm. to to hire the right SDR, even you've got to really know your stuff. Yeah. So um, yeah, it's 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 a massive it's a massive challenge. I mean, you you've been there. You I I'm only going to assume, but mm. I guess you're the first salesperson at Air, right? You know what yeah. that looks like and yeah. to do it again once you become more senior is quite a tough mm. psychological and emotional thing so you are really looking for a, a pretty unique set of yeah. skills to, yeah. to work. yeah do you know and i think you've touched on something there because i you're right i fall into that sales-led founder mentality but for me it was the opposite so i will hire somebody at an sdr level because i know i can lead them but that meant that i didn't have the capacity to do something else so i had to hire and plug the gap elsewhere which was yeah. my weakness and i think it's just the opposite way around and sometimes Founders can play that role of the first sales leader in the business, but they need to be prepared to let go of something else yeah, yeah. because you can't do it part time. You know, it can't be well. you can, but it can't be a, a 10, 20 percent of your role. It's got to have a real focus on it. Yeah, um, yeah it's re really interesting. I think that, that, you know, I can see a lot of founders getting to that point where they think, right, we need to grow. Let's hire a salesperson. And that's it. That's as far as it goes. And I guess, it, yeah, well, what does that mean? What kind of salesperson? What is a what sales? level? Yeah, yeah. Like, what is a salesperson? Most, like, most product founders, like, hate the image of salespeople generally anyway. Mm -hmm. They really don't know what they're looking at because they, they don't want to be, like, hiring that, like, what they would see as a typical salesperson. So mm -hmm. then where they look, because most people, most, a lot of salespeople, especially yeah. average ones, are typical salespeople. So, uh, yeah, it's, um, it, it's a really, yeah. really big challenge for founders. And then I guess they end up down that route of just hiring people they like, which is yeah. not necessarily a sensible thing as well. Yeah. And as you said before, they're giving them no, you know, best case scenario, poor, worst case scenario, no processes. Yeah. And you're asking somebody who's never built that before to go and build it. And who knows what you could could end up with. And I can, you know, to me, that's a really obvious no, no, unless you're a sales led founder and you know what you're doing. Uh, I, I agree. It's no, no. I, I guess there's something at the other end of the scale as well, isn't there? So I think you've posted around, you know, the corporate um, first sales hire and bringing somebody in who isn't prepared to, you said it, roll up their sleeves, make 60, you've got to be an SDR for a while, you've got to be in the trenches and see what that looks and feels like before you get started. And there are people that are, are beyond that, above that, that, that oh, gosh, play like, the right role in the interview, but not yeah. come in and contribute. Yeah, you, you, you're absolutely right. And all, and all I'm trying to do through my content is raise potential red, red flags because it's not always the case like there's an exception to every rule right so don't don't take it as red that if somebody has salesforce hp ibm oracle as their background they're not going to be a good hire it's just a lot less likely in my experience i speak to a lot of um again particularly technical or financial founders who they've gone for um and it's probably so so relative but obviously in um in the 80s, I think it was, there was IBM's marketing campaign was nobody gets fired for buying IBM, yeah. right? And so that concept is, I think, what people are trying to apply there. Like, they've been working at Salesforce five years. They've been working at Oracle five years. How could they go? How could this go wrong? It's like a safe play, I think, in a lot of people's minds. Actually, processes were built at Oracle and Salesforce 20 years ago. In fact, somebody wrote a book about the Salesforce one and pretty much smashed the entire SaaS industry up as a result. Yeah. So, like that, that was done 20 years ago, right? That isn't something that they've been there, done, seen. They've been a, an active part of. They've, they've never not had shitloads of collateral that a prospect asks a question and they go, oh, yeah, this, is, this answers that for you. Yeah. What, what do you do when you're coming into this role? Somebody asks you a question, you go, shit, we haven't got anything to help with that. Mm. I don't like that. <laughs> That's yeah. like job number one is get like black more off the call go write that bit of content and go get it across to them kind of thing it's just mm. a totally different landscape and um not only have they probably had teams of sdrs doing their calling or they've got such a strong brand reputation that when they do pick up the phone it's always effective or they just have so many inbound leads that it's uh, it's an easy role like 
all those things, they just don't fit with a business that's barely getting off the ground, trying to like go towards its seed or its series mm. A. And really, nobody knows who you are when you pick up the phone. Like yeah. we, um, we, we always, we, we use um, one of our pattern disrupts, our most, our kind of our most commonly used pattern disrupt is I O and it's Greg from Clean. Does that name ring a bell? No, most of the time it doesn't. Like, and that's part of the reason for the pattern disrupt. But like, actually, hi Owen, it's Greg from Salesforce. Does that name ring a bell? Oh yeah, I've come across you guys. Like that, yeah. that, that difference is uh, it's a, it's a very different place to be. And if you've if you've got comfy in a in a yeah EV full of great brands, you've you've always had the the former, not the latter. So uh, the latter, not the former. That's not the former. Do you know? I'm going to give a really good example around that that I think will get people. Uh, hopefully, people understand that. So. Um, we, we do some work with a large reseller of a technology and we A-B tested the dial to connect ratio using the partner's brand versus the actual, the, 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 the technology brand that I, I won't give names. Um, and we saw more than a 50% uplift in dial to connect ratio because we used a brand that people know versus a brand yeah. that doesn't. So it's just, for me, it's really clean, direct evidence that, no pun intended, that, um, that, that it is easier when you're sitting in a known brand because you yeah. are having more conversations, if nothing else. And I think what you end up with in that scenario, correct me if I'm wrong, is probably paying a premium for somebody who hasn't done it before, but yeah. may, maybe you, you make the mistake that they have and, and will more likely than not, not understand the environment that they're in and why they can't have things a certain way. So if you think about I've worked in small growing businesses and, and founder led businesses all my career. If I went and walked into HubSpot or Salesforce tomorrow, I wouldn't know the processes that they uh, use. I wouldn't know. Uh, I, I understand the sales conversation and that sort of stuff, but I wouldn't understand the decision making processes. I wouldn't uh, understand the politics. I'd have no idea what I was doing. I'd be, you know, I'd be up shit's creek, so to speak. And um, I, I it's think the same the other way around, I would have thought. I've, I've always said, like, I reckon if I went into that kind of business, I'd be fired in like. Six yeah. Years. Because you like, just made a decision you shouldn't have, and and that's the that's the other that's the other thing actually. Like that kind of hire, not in a way that the junior definitely doesn't, but that kind of hire, like by being in a business of that type for so long, mm. they are politically savvy. So like it's almost more difficult to get them out once they're in because they yeah. work the they work the right way with the board, the investors. They give good answers for why stuff isn't working or like like mm. actually in that type of business, there's not much. Yeah, account, but like ownership of like yeah i've screwed up because actually there's so much dispersal mm -hmm. like dispersal of, yeah. uh, of, yeah. of responsibility and accountability so having somebody who sits there with the board and goes you know what the reason we haven't been successful this quarter is and it's my it's my fault and i'm going to fix it again even less likely from somebody who's coming from that background so i think it's, it can be quite uh it can be quite a dangerous hire for for the founder yeah, do you know, and also they'd have an SDR manager. So, did they have that frontline yeah. management response? Oh, there's loads of things we can go. We we need to talk about all of the examples here. So, I'm going to move on from that one, and we can always come back to it if we have time. Uh, you also touched on the um, the competitor hire, and I guess there are lots of different types of um, different ways you'd find your first sales hire. Yeah. Talk to us about that option. Yeah, I think there's there's a, there's a common uh, common I'll call it a misconception, but there's a common perception that. Yeah somebody's going to come in, they're going to have a little black book, they've already done all their prospecting. So they kind of know, they know where they implemented their solution two years ago. So why will they not be able to replace that? Yeah. There were disruptive, were better than that solution. Why would they not? Just, but really, that's it's a bit of a fallacy anyway, isn't it? Once yeah. once a product's in, it's actually very difficult to get it out. So you mm. put a competitor across to replace a lot of their business. Isn't that likely in the modern SaaS world? People yeah. tend to implement and stick unless there's clear clear pain or disruption so that that in itself is flawed in the most part especially if a business has been venture capitalist backed everybody's everybody above any level like anybody above ae level really is is going to come with some sort of restricted covenant about um about moving business or moving pipeline so mm -hmm. you're not going to be able to get your ae to go back in even if they're mid process with a with 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 a with a with a, a prospect so there's there's a lot of there's a lot of problems in that sense but the other thing is you then you you get like your eyes blurred by this idea of them coming in with their black book and quick wins mm. and I think you're more likely then to make exceptions for things that are actually limiting in terms of their personality traits their skill set and all that type of thing because yeah. you're blinded and the, the waters are muddied by this potential that you see 
So if I'm a founder, I'm looking at it thinking, first and foremost, it is good that they understand the sector. Like it is, like you can't get away from that. Yes. Sector knowledge is good. But actually forget about that. Hire somebody based on their personality traits and then take that as a bonus. Don't mm -hmm. hire them for their black book because that's yeah. really successful. Mm. It's interesting. I think people have more and more product loyalty now. And like you said, there are more moving parts. It's, it's, it's integrated with other technologies. There are things that make it harder. Um, and I would buy a software based on the person selling it and they would influence that, but I wouldn't keep using it based on it. If it wasn't working for the business, I make a special decision. And if it is, I'm done well sticking with it. And if that person leaves and goes to another company and tells me that one's better, well, they told me this one was the best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, so suddenly, which, which time are they lying? It, it yeah. changes things, doesn't it? Um, oh, yeah. yeah, it's interesting to, to think. So we've got the, go on. I was just saying that they're a hired gun if they're like if that was broken and then they're willing to move and then it's like oh yeah, it's, yeah it's, they 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 don't have they it hurts their own credibility right so. yeah absolutely and I, I can see why people would it's the flashing lights isn't it they want that wow this person's gonna be two years down the line already because they know x y and z but you're not looking at the damage they can cause but maybe they're wrong cultural fit maybe they did that but did it a different way to the way that you would want to yeah. do it there's all sorts of possibilities so we talked about three there the junior. SDR level high who's not done it before, the corporate who think looks like they've done it, but but they were so far beyond it, and the competitor who might not be the right sort of cultural DNA fit. Is there anything else that you should be looking to avoid? Um, I think those those are probably the three main ones for me. Mm. I, I just think that my biggest concern for any founders, and obviously the the all the conversation this up to this point has really been about about founders and, and yeah. what they're for. I, I hope we'll move on to how how sales people can yeah. help. But I think. The, the risk for founders is how do you know what you're hiring if you don't know what you're hiring? And, and that's that's the scariest thing. And um, in the same way as I'm going to lead on to salespeople doing their own due diligence, like you've got to do a significant volume of due diligence on somebody. I don't think you can take them through a, a classic hiring process. Like mm. the more evidence you can gather, the more referrals you can gather, the better really in the, in this yeah. hire. It's just going out to a, a bog standard recruiter and being like, go mm -hmm. find me for a sales hire. It's not going to be that successful. Um, there's a handful that specialize in it and seem to do a solid job of it. But um, yeah, I, I wouldn't say it's the, the route to go really like take, yeah. take as much social proof as you possibly can um, rather than just taking the salesperson or the recruiter's word for it. Yeah. Okay. So you, I, I want to flip it over in a second to your seat going in, what you should be looking at and what you should be thinking about. Before we do that, we've talked about the things to look out for. What are the obvious things you absolutely have to do? So if you are that founder and you're hiring, are there things that you say that, you know, I think you've touched on it there, that the, the, the interview process needs to be very different. Are there other things that you absolutely need to look for? Is there a sweet spot somewhere between corporate and junior that, 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 that makes somebody more likely to be right? Yeah, I think I think understanding you you'll get a lot from the way that people talk about um, certain skills within sales. If people talk with a passion about cold calling and and prospecting, that's that's the fundamental thing that you need to do when you come into this role. Yeah. Like, regardless of how much strategy you're going to be able to build and all that, like we can't get away from the fact the first thing you're doing is is prospecting and it's it's a pipeline, yeah. Same skill you can do for your whole career, but you've actually got to have that passion, that want, and that need for it. Mm -hmm. like, my biggest thing is like I just love, as I know you do, like creating a phone first culture. Like that's yeah. my that is my probably my passion in sales is like creating mm -hmm. a phone first culture. Get a load of people who just understand the power of this thing that rings yeah. and, and make it successful. It's not that uh, difficult, is it? No, it's not. <laughs> Literally, you pick it up somebody's on the other end of the phone at least a few times a day, they might buy some stuff off you. Uh, <laughs> it's, pretty, it's, pretty, it's pretty black and white, actually. Um, but getting that in, and, and, and I think that's what you're looking for. You're looking for that, because that is a sign of that, just like a little bit of grit, a little bit of deep down and dirty with it yeah. kind of thing. Like, I'm still a passionate seller. I think that's, mm. a, that's a, a massive, a massively important thing. And like from the conversations that we've, we've had before this call, but also just like previously as well, like you have that, you start that passion for sales, right? It's not a, it's not a strategic job. It is a strategic job, of course it is, yeah. but there's a there's a fundamental set of skills and pleasure found in being a salesperson if you are that right person to go on that journey. So ambition is massive. They should be joining you because they want to be a co like they want to be considered like a co-founder. Yeah. 
not not to come in and, and just take your word for it because you don't know enough to build a strategy. So why would you, why is it your, why is your word best? Um, you need that energy. You need that, that passion for sales, no doubt. Um, resilience as well. Like it's a classic thing to test in sales, but at the end of the day, like this is really hard. Like you have some really hard days growing a business and being mm -hmm. there higher and um, then that growth mindset it's everything it's really it's everything everything you're looking for from any salesperson but um with somebody who's got that background of proving that they can repeatedly do the gritty bit mm. and also then go and implement the strategy and yeah. um, if i was to say to any founder go read predictable revenue like predictable revenue is probably slightly out of date now is the reality mm. like in terms of the overall structure like some of the stuff like email wasn't prevalent when it was written so yeah. all the email bits because now people's emails and linkedin are so flooded mm -hmm. whatever but the core the core structure of a of a 180 120 model like specialization all those kind of things that will give you a good mm -hmm. guidance on what you might be looking for from somebody to talk you through that strategy in more detail yeah and then obviously that's been taken to another level with um, from impossible to inevitable. So you probably want to understand that as well, because in the first handful of chapters in from impossible to inevitable, it gives you a really good look at ways of testing whether you're ready to really yeah. throw, scale that business. So yeah, read predictable revenue, read from impossible to inevitable, so that you understand at least some of the context of the go to market fit mm. conversation that people are going to have with you. Because yeah. if you don't, you put yourself at a massive disadvantage. Yeah, it's interesting. I often say to people, um, what I want is for somebody who's grown something before in in this kind of role, but who can't tell me why they grow it, grew it and did well, but who can tell me the things that they got wrong along the way and what yeah, they yeah. wouldn't do again. Yeah. Because I think, you know, you don't do this without making mistakes. No. And it's those mistakes, you know, talk about starting air in the UK over Australia. We went much faster here, not because I knew what to do, but because I knew what not to do. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think that's that's often th a thing that gets ignored. It's like, what was successful? No, no, no. What did you do that you're never going to do again? And let's make sure that we avoid those things. Look, I'm conscious of time. I want to flip this over for a second. Let's put you in the seat that you were in a year ago, thinking about joining first sales hire in a newly funded, I think the series, series A, was it series A funding at the, at the no, time? I mean, perhaps at the time. That was it. Okay, fine. So you've since had some funding though. Uh, yeah, at the time of recording, it's not been publicly announced, but we are on the investors' websites now, so it kind of has. But we'll by the time this airs, it'll be announced. So, so we'll go with yes. Yeah, we'll go. We'll with go with yes. Great, fantastic. We've just we've just, we've just taken and, and launched our seed round. So yeah, uh, uh, let me be the first to congratulate you. <laughs> well, there you go. So let's look at that. So your first one in. What are the things that you needed to, whether you did or or not, I don't know, but you needed to and look back and should have done and didn't or, or, or absolutely did on the way in. And anybody who's watching this is thinking of taking that step up from an AE role into a first in or somebody who's done first once and is going to go and do it again. What am I thinking of? For me, and this is this is coming from having just very recently been through the funding, yeah. role, the funding round, you want to do exactly what VCs do. They confidently approach the business founders knowing that they have something that the founders don't have and therefore confidently ask them a key set of questions and a key set of evidence to prove success or perceived success or potential success, right? You want to do exactly the same because you want to be going into an environment that is set up for you to succeed. Mm. Like there's too many founders who think, oh, well, like I shouldn't have to go for somebody that good because we've kind of already hit the spot. Like we've already got some inbounds coming in, the product's already selling. That's not right. You actually want to, you still want to be hiring the person who understands that they need that, um, they need that level of, like, yeah, the, the, the person who understands the business well enough to ask the right questions. So there's a, there's a level of modesty from the founders required for that same person to be like, look, what I want is I want you to make me a list of all the logos you've got so far, where they came from, how did you acquire them? That's a massive one. If it's like founder sale, founder sale, founder sale, founder sale, or it's channel, 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 then yeah, it looks like you're gonna have a good channel model. That's a massively good thing. Nobody knows nobody that, but it doesn't evidence the fact that there's gonna be a clear outbound strategy yeah. 
place or a clear outbound um, strategy to implement. Um, what type of problem was each client trying to solve? And this is a big old spreadsheet, right? If they've got to 30 or 40 logos as a, as a, yeah. as a business, then ask them for most of it. Like they can be like, founders can be like, oh, there's a few that just aren't relevant or whatever, but you want to see like 20 to 30 of those that go, yeah, I understand that this is why they have bought that. Mm. Who's the economic buyer? Who was the champion? Who was the first point of contact? If you can get all this stuff, which they should know, then all of a sudden you can you can map and you can go, actually, I mean, yeah, they've kind of always gone in through the head of sales. That is an attractive thing. If I, yeah. if I know that they've, even if they've done it accidentally, inadvertently narrowed down their ICP and their persona, boom, I can hit the ground running because then I know I'm going to build the database when I do start my SDR yeah. work of heads of sales in businesses that look like those other businesses. Yeah. Um, happiness criteria or success criteria or success signals from previous clients or current yeah. clients like have they grown into new regions or have they um i don't know if you've somehow start if the founders have somehow started doing like um surveys or something to, to yeah. sell for, for customer happiness like are they are they happy like what what are the what are the success criteria that the founders people come back yeah come back like yeah. are they are they like what's what's the churn? Like if if, mm. if it's been plugging away for eighteen months to two years, and they made their first founder sales twenty four months ago, what's then like what's their net revenue retention? Yeah. The same yeah. questions that investors ask, right? Because mm. that's they're, they're the key signals. Founders have to be open enough to say that. If they're not, and they won't give you that information, it's the biggest red flag of all. Wrong person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. It, it, it's not. They haven't done it. it. They haven't done what they're saying they've done. If if, yeah. if they won't give you that information. Mm. Um, so yeah, treat it like a due diligence process is probably the best piece of advice for okay. that pre pre sale or pre purchase or pre hire the salesperson. I like that. I like it because I think and I, it tells you a lot. So it's not. I'm guessing a big chunk of that is about the information, but a big chunk of that is about working through something with a founder because yeah. this is not going to be an easy ride, and you need to know that you can challenge and and collaborate and ask questions and get openness from them. And that's a really good way of testing it without asking those questions. If they, if, if they won't sit you down and show you their numbers and show you their books and even like walk you around their HubSpot or their Salesforce, mm. they are ultimately trying to hide something. Like you, you it, it, uh, or if it, like you get those people in SaaS or just business generally who are so naive that they're like, oh, well, we can't be transparent about that stuff. What happens if you go to a competitor? Like, again, not the right person. That's just like crazy, right? That's madness. Yeah. Like don't don't work with that person either but there's there's 101 red flags for if somebody won't give you like honest and open transparent mm. um, feedback and um i think you're absolutely right what you said there owen is that it's a terrible start if they won't give you they won't give you transparency they won't treat this like a partnership mm. uh, they're giving lip service to it then because it's definitely yeah. become that once you're in the business yeah. Yeah, I read something on one of your posts recently, which I think really hit the nail on the head. And it was around not treating the first sales high like an employee. Yeah. Can you expand on that and what you mean with that? Yeah, like ultimately they're an employee, right? In, in a lot of cases. Of um, wonderful if you actually want to bring somebody on to be a co-founder. Like if there's, there's a lot of solo product founders who could really benefit from giving a commercial person with the right set of skills, mm -hmm. the right set of evidence skills, uh, like a co-founder responsibility and a, a co-founder package yeah. and, and really like bring them on board to be that brother in arms because that's that's really what the product founder should be looking for as well mm -hmm. they want to own products and tech entirely so go find that brother in arms or that sister in arms who can be that person with you yeah um, but that's even if you're not going down that route even if you're just bringing them on to found the commercial arm of the business in an unofficial capacity, which is what I've done at Clean. Like I didn't come in as a founder or co-founder. I just came in to, to found the commercial arm, really, like mm -hmm. as, a, as, a, as a construct or a concept. Um, you, need to, you need to know and you need to not be the blocker to progress because you've really, you've hired them to be that partner. You've hired mm -hmm. them to know how to solve it. So bring them in, work with them, be like, I'll go over here and make awesome product. You go over here and make an awesome commercial engine. Put those two things together because there's only two departments that matter in a yeah. sense in reality. And we'll do something ace together. If you come in, if they come in and you like question everything they do and 
and push like micromanaging them because that's what you're used to with other like engineers mm. that you're working with or whatever. It's just not going to work because you've, you're bringing them in to do something you weren't capable of. You have to trust them to then execute yeah. on it. And um, one of my like my my previous um, my previous founder actually when I put that post up, he made a really good point. So Derry um, is CEO at One Up Sales, which is mm. my old company, and he was like, look the founder's job is to find people they can trust like trustfully put in charge of each department and then let them succeed yeah so you then block everything the commercial hire is trying to do or slow it down or ask for too many reports all mm -hmm. these things it's an operational thing just execute mm -hmm. execute for the first like six to 12 months when yeah. you do this role don't be that founder and if you get an inkling as a salesperson that the founder might be that person that's a massive red flag in the build as well. And you should be hiring somebody who's better than you at something. So why wouldn't you trust them? Um, because if you're hiring somebody who's worse than you, then you've really failed from 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 um, day one as well. Um, yeah. Which is really interesting. I'm conscious of time, so let's just 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 fi final thing. Let's just touch on, touch on package and things that should be included. So if I'm if I'm listening to this and I'm thinking about that move, what are the types of things I should be factoring into to to to, to the package discussions? Salary, like normal. Mm. Options or equity, normally options. Um, kickers, performance-related kickers, particularly mm. around options yeah. rather than around salary. However, yeah. I think a sensible thing to do, especially if you're taking a step back initially on your salary or your overall um, OTE, is to say, look, I get it. It's an earlier stage business. I'm happy with that. But why don't we put a milestone in place? If I mean, I, I, I've done this everywhere I've been so far, pretty much. Yeah. Um, and I've, I've put milestones in place to, to meet success criteria. Um, and if you get that level of if you get that level of support, they'll, they'll buy into that. Like if they are mm -hmm. more than you being their long term fix, they'll be like, yeah, yeah we'll, pr we'll promote you back to your old salary once we get to first seed round or a million quid, whatever it might be. Yeah. Like, set but setting that up initially is quite good but then everything right a lot of these businesses don't have any hr process so be talking about like holiday so clean because it didn't really have any like mm. our infrastructure when i came in um because it was a really really small team like it was it was just like oh well your holiday is 20 days and i was like well the rest of the industry is kind of 25 days minimum actually in sam mm. like i want to be hiring good people in the next six months i don't want to be offering them 20 days can you look at that yeah, okay, let's go to industry standard on that. Mat leave, pat leave, all these different things. Like if they're important to you and you think they're going to be important yeah. for your hiring, put them all on the table. Like if you've got expenses that you need, like phone bills, all this kind of stuff, everything's on the table. I did a post of it, like 10 top 15 things that you might want to negotiate on is one of my posts. So um, feel free to check that out on my LinkedIn, but um, always open to ideas as well. Do you know, it's like any negotiation process. It's a give and a take and it's a value exchange. So what you're most likely giving up as a first in is a basic salary. And what might, you're most likely going to have to give up as a founder is those add-ons and kickers and those sorts of things. But both have to do it one side without the other won't work. And I think that probably summarises it pretty well. Great. I'm really conscious of time. I know you've got to crack on. So we'll wrap up there. I think that's really useful. I feel like we could probably do another hour on this, Nate. So um, maybe there's a whole other conversation on it. Yeah, there's so much in there, so much. Really quickly, though, before you run, tell us if somebody wants to get in touch with you or your team and talk to clean.ai about how you can help, where can they find you? How can they get in touch? www.clean.ai greg at clean.ai or you can go on my linkedin greg freeman um at clean.ai yeah nice uh, and i'm open to every channel feel free to get in touch with me however you want nice love it and of course there's loads more content that you're putting out on this topic right now so go and follow greg on linkedin because there's some fantastic stuff coming out uh greg thank you thank you ever so much for joining us i've really enjoyed it and i think we've got a hell of a lot of knowledge out of you today so um yeah, thank you for sharing your experience again all right cheers go bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.